Good morning. So happy to see this room full. My name is Carrie Cooper and I'm Dean of University Libraries. If you've been to this event on the Saturday breakfast with, alum with an alumni author, um, if you've been before, raise your hand. I see a lot of repeaters. I love that. Repeat guests for this homecoming tradition. It's wonderful to have you. If you're new to this event, or if you haven't been in this building for a long time, it has evolved and changed a lot over time. Um, it's beautiful. We are very intentional about way we have, the way we have grown this building. Um, so feel free after the talk to wander around and see all that is here. This is one of our students' favorite places to spend time. Um, and we're really proud of that. Happy to have you on this fall morning. Um, I am thrilled to be the Dean of University Libraries at William and Mary and to see so many of you here for the 12th annual Homecoming Author Breakfast. We began this tradition in 2012 and have held it every year since, even during the pandemic, although that year's event was held on Zoom. Our first guest authors were the husband-wife duo Tom Engelberger and C.C. Bell, class of 1992. And since then, we've welcomed Anne-Marie Paste, Alexandra Bracken, Carter Higgins, Mary Quattlebaum, Aaron Spencer, Catherine Erskine, Sarah Lewis Holmes, Padma Van Trinkeman, and Anna Clapsaddle, among others. We are very proud of this community of alumni authors that we have built, and we look forward to doing more with alumni authors and also others who want to be writing um, in community in the years ahead. Joining this impressive group today is our speaker, Lauren Shippen Harrington. Lauren is a 2013 graduate of William and Mary, and while at William and Mary, she majored in music and was a member of the jazz a cappella group Double Take. After graduation, Lauren moved to LA and quickly started to make her mark in the entertainment world. Lauren has become well known for her work in fiction podcasts. She wrote and produced the Bright Sessions podcast, which ran for four seasons between 2015 and 2018, with Lauren writing the show and voicing one of the main characters, Sam Barnes. By 2018, the Bright Sessions had reached 8 million downloads, and Lauren wrote a series of books about the characters from the show, with the first book, The Infinite Noise, published in 2019, followed by A Neon Darkness in 2020 and Some Far Away Place in 2021. She's been very busy. <laughs> You'll hear more about these books in Lauren's talk today. Lauren also writes and directs the award-winning podcasts Bridgewater and Passenger List, as well as Surviving Hawkins, a Stranger Things podcast. Her newest podcast is Breaker Whiskey, a fiction podcast following a woman after an apocalyptic event in the 1960s. And this is only a snapshot of what Lauren has been up to since leaving William and Mary 10 years ago. Before I welcome Lauren to the stage, I want to recognize the beautiful soul who brought this annual event to life, or at least the idea of it. Mary Mitchell, class of 1985. Mary was a lover of books and this library, and she wanted SWIM to connect our alumni authors with our library community. Sadly, she passed away after a brief battle with cancer, but her legacy lives on in this event, which is sponsored by the Mary Mitchell Speakers Series Fund. Thank you, Lauren, for spending some of your time at your 10-year reunion here with us at SWEM. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Carrie, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to SWEM for inviting me. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I'm Lauren Shippen. I was Lauren Harrington here at school. Shippen is my middle name and my author name. So if you recognize me but couldn't figure out why, you probably knew me as Lauren Harrington. And I am a published author, fiction podcast director, writer, producer. I wear a lot of hats. And yeah, also class of 2013. Walking around campus yesterday, I couldn't quite believe that it's been 10 years since I graduated because it always feels like home coming back. But then I thought about what happened in the last 10 years, and it's like, oh yeah, a lot has happened. <laughs> it's been a very busy 10 years. And I have a career now and live a life now that I never could have anticipated when I was a student here. 
And that's partly because I didn't know that I wanted to do what I do now. And partly because the job that I have didn't really exist back in 2013. And so I really had to build my own career, kind of create my own path. There was no guidebook for me to follow. And I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about how I did that today and hopefully share some lessons that I've learned over the years that can apply to any kind of passion-driven career. So before we get too deep into that, uh, to give a little more of an overview of what I do, I am a published author. I wrote three young adult novels with Tortine, which is an imprint of Macmillan Publishing, and those books are an extension of the universe I created with The Bright Sessions. So The Bright Sessions is a podcast about people with supernatural abilities in therapy, and each of the bo books follows a particular character from the podcast as they deal with their ability and their life. So the first book, The Infinite Noise, is about a teenage empath who falls in love with a fellow student. The second book, A Neon Darkness, is about an 18-year-old with the power of persuasion. It's kind of a villain origin story. And the third book, Some Faraway Place, is about a dream diver, a girl who can go into people's dreams and how that affects her family life and her personal relationships. So a little bit of sci-fi, a little bit of fantasy, a lot of heart and character growth. That's kind of the zone that I stay in in most of my writing, really character-driven, grounded sci-fi or fantasy. And coming to publishing, through a fiction podcast is not necessarily like the most linear path. Uh, it is something that other people have done. I'm not the only person who's forged that particular path, but I do know all of the other people who have personally. So that should give you like an idea of how big the space is. And fiction podcasting is really where I spend most of my time and make most of my living. Um, you might not really be familiar with fiction podcasting. It's a very niche part of podcasting, but I think I can safely say that everybody here has heard a podcast before, or at least knows what a podcast is. Yeah, okay. Um, that might seem like a silly thing to clarify, but back in 2015 when I started, that was not a given. Less than a quarter of Americans listen to a podcast every month, and uh, now that number is about half, with, which of course the, the people who listen maybe occasionally rather than monthly is much, much higher. Um, and fiction podcasting remains a very, very small portion of that. But it's exactly what it sounds like. It's old school radio drama, it's TV show for your ears. There's a lot of different ways to refer to it. But basically anything that you're gonna find on a streaming site like Netflix, you can find for free in your podcast app just without the visuals. So it's full cast, full script, full score, full sound design, uh, can be any kind of format, any kind of genre. I've produced science fiction, horror, drama, romance, musicals. It's a really broad reaching genre, uh, medium, which is one of the things I really, really love about it. And while I do wear many, many different hats in fiction podcasting, I've done literally every job in fiction podcasting at one point, I do primarily focus on writing, and writing is what I love. Writing is not what I thought I was going to do. I sort of fell backwards into writing. I actually wanted to be an actor. That is what I moved to Los Angeles to do. I had always wanted to be a musical theater performer, which is why I majored in music while I was here. But by the time I got to the end of college, I'd really fallen in love with television. It was 2013, it was like the peak of the golden age of television, that medium was really exciting me. And so I moved to LA to pursue acting and then just became like the most cliched actor in the world. Like I was doing just everything that you expect an actor to do. I was going to a million auditions and I wasn't getting roles. I was working a ton of random jobs. I was a dog sitter, a personal assistant to a reality show host. That was an interesting job. I eventually got a job at a sandwich shop that I loved because the sandwiches were great, but it did have the very heavy-handed metaphor of the fact that we could see the Hollywood sign from the front counter. <laughs> and so I would be standing at the counter putting together catering orders for the casting studios down the street that I'd be trying to get auditions at and the film lot next door that I would hope one day I'd be filming on. To this day, I still remember the Coen Brothers salad orders. And all the while, I'd be looking out in the Hollywood sign and just like being so close to this thing that I wanted to be doing and not actually doing it. And I found the process of, of being an, an actor very, very frustrating because even when I was getting jobs, they were really quick. It was so different from theater. You know, you're not starting out being a series regular on TV. You're doing little guest spots. You're doing short films, student films, web series, things like that, which usually meant getting a script, showing up on set the next day, doing your role, and then you leave that character behind and you never think about them again. I also didn't love being on set. Uh, there's the old adage that actors get paid to wait, they do the acting for free. 
And it's true because 98% of your time on set is just waiting around. I got very good at knitting and crosswords. <laughs> and so I wasn't, I wasn't loving the experience of acting. And thankfully at the time, I was at this great studio, acting studio in North Hollywood, BGB studio, where I was taking acting classes every single week. And they were really encouraging us to make our own stuff because this was now 2014. Web series were really kicking off. They were selling to traditional network television. People were getting nominated for awards on films that they shot on their iPhones. So it felt like a time when you could really take control of your career in a particular way. I don't think necessarily that actors should have to become writers, directors, producers. Being an actor should be enough. But for me, this really ap appealed to me because I was missing some creative fulfillment that I had had previously. And so I, I realized that I wanted to make my own thing, and that's what became the Bright Sessions. And I'll sort of talk in more detail about how that happened in a bit. And through making the Bright Sessions and writing it, I discovered that actually writing is the thing that I love doing. It is the thing that's giving me all the fulfillment that I get from acting without any of the stuff about acting that I don't really like. And that was when I learned uh, what is my first lesson here, which is, to understand your passion. Having a passion is not necessarily enough of a compass. Sometimes it is, for me it's not. I, I knew I loved acting and I never really examined that too deeply. I've always been really, really passionate about art. I always knew I wanted to work in the arts. The passion that I have for things is actually the reason I came to William Mary in the first place. I was really, really into the stuff that I was into as a teenager, which at least in the mid-2000s did not make me cool. And so I was really looking for a place to belong and taking a campus tour here, I just got the feeling that everybody here had something they were really passionate about and that they were gonna tell you about their passion and then they were gonna wanna hear about your passion too and I loved that. And I'm really happy to say that in my four years here that definitely proved to be true, so much so I became a campus tour guide myself and that was kind of my final pitch to prospective students was like no matter what thing you're really nerdy about, people here wanna hear about it. So I don't think anybody in this room has a problem with passion and having a passion, whether that's something you want to pursue as a career or as a hobby or just something that gives you fulfillment in your life. The thing that I work on constantly is understanding why I love the things that I love. That's something that's become increasingly important to me. It's something I only realized after becoming a writer by accident. I loved acting because I could dig into a character, really embody them, really understand them from the inside out. I could build a relationship with their character and another character by working with another actor, by working with a director. I could help people feel things and understand the story through a character. That's all what a writer does. I didn't love being on set. I didn't even necessarily love being up on stage. I just really wanted to do all of the like, you know, imagination scene work that you do as an actor. And that's just what I get to do as a writer every single day. And so now, whenever I'm feeling stuck or feeling unfulfilled, I do uh, what I like to call a passion audit, which is probably the most boring word to put next to the word passion. Um, I do a couple of different audits uh, as a creative freelancer. The first is a time audit, which is so necessary because every single day, if you're a freelancer, is like something totally different. And sometimes you'll sort of have months where you're in a particularly different rhythm and it can be really helpful to sit down and kind of look at how you're spending your time and audit your time and figure out if anything needs to be shifted. And the same is true for your passion. So for example, I produce a lot. Producing means something different in film, TV, theater, podcasting, depending on who you're talking to. It's like the most vague term in entertainment. Um, for fiction podcasting, in my case, executive producing usually just means that I am sort of in charge of running the show. I'm doing all the hiring. I'm helping the writers, actors, directors kind of get their feet, go through the process, creating the timeline, making sure that the train is running on time. It's something I really enjoy, but something that is incredibly time consuming and incredibly exhausting. And a couple of years ago, I realized that that's pretty much all I was doing. I was just producing other people's work. I wasn't really writing my stuff as much. And I took a step back and I thought about what do I love about producing and how can I maybe do it in smaller ways so that I'm not sinking my time into these big productions. And the thing I love about producing is getting to guide creators who are not from audio through writing a fiction podcast because most of the people that I produce are coming from TV or playwriting or book writing and bringing them into the medium and helping them understand how best to tell their story is something I really enjoy. I also love the creative freedom of audio fiction and how a writer can tell their story exactly as they want and I can help them do that in the best way possible. And so by doing that passion audit, kind of realizing the things I loved about producing, 
I realized I should just open a consulting part of my business. And so now I do consulting and I help empower creators at the beginning of their process so that they can become their own producers. I didn't have a guidebook when I started out, and so I wrote one and released that earlier this year and have a bunch of different resources for podcasters just through my business that people can use. And those things allow me to get that same kind of fulfillment from producing without actually having to like spend eight months producing somebody else's show. So that's what I mean by a passion audit. And I think it also works on a smaller level, that question of why do you love what you love? To go on a brief tangent about writer's block. Uh, writer's block is a very scary term. It sort of conjures an image of something that's insurmountable and unconquerable. And I think most of the time, the solution to writer's block is just muscling through it. You just have to write something really bad. That is probably the most important thing you can do as a writer and something that all of my other writer friends are constantly, we're constantly trying to get better at is learning how to write badly. <laughs> because you get so in your head, you don't let that first draft be bad and you need to let it be bad. And so there's a couple of writer blocks, hacks that I use to kind of encourage myself to write bad. Um, the first is what I like to call the video game save. I use, I use this mostly in book writing where when I get to a point in writing a scene where I'm stuck and I don't know where to go and it's not flowing, I find the last sentence, the last paragraph that I felt confident on, that sort of save point, and I delete everything back to that point. It always hurts, sometimes you're deleting a lot, but it, it's helpful because then you start from that same point that you were confident from and you write in a completely different direction. Sometimes what you write is not something you're gonna keep, but you're gonna kind of shake something loose. The other hack I use is uh, what I call medical medical, which I took from Shonda Rhimes' masterclass, <laughs> where she talks about writing Grey's Anatomy and how they would have to wait for the research assistant to kind of get the actual medical jargon for the show, but the first draft would just be character and plot, and so they would just put medical medical in place of all of the medical jargon that was eventually gonna go in there. So hand me that medical medical so I can medical medical and save this patient's life, right? That's what the script would read. And that's what I do now in a lot of my scripts. You know, it's like if a character needs to reveal a secret, but I don't know how they're going to do it yet, the dialogue's not coming. It's just like secret revealed, and then I jump to the aftermath of that. And that, like, that's a nice little workaround. You can use that too in writing books. I'm terrible at writing action in books, and so sometimes I'll just put in bra brackets, fight occurs, and then you know jump to the next thing. It's a bit of a tangent. Those are just some good hacks. Sometimes you do those hacks, and they don't work, and you realize that the thing that's the problem is that there's something wrong with the character arc, there's something wrong with the plot, and that's where doing this same passion audit, doing this question of why do I love what I love, comes in handy. Anytime I would get stuck on the Bright Sessions, I would step back and think about what, what is the reason I'm telling the story? Why do I love telling the story? I love the mental health aspect, I love the found family narrative, I loved found family narratives. I like the, the fact that people can always get better even as they stumble along the way. So what are the things I can do in the plot right now that can help refocus on on those values. So it's something that works in a lot of different different levels and something that I learned uh, as I really discovered that I loved writing. But first I had to discover that I loved writing and I had to actually make the thing. So to jump back a little bit to the beginning of the Bright Sessions, I had an idea for a character. I knew I wanted to write something for myself to act and I've had panic attacks for my whole life um, and so I was like, write what you know. And I decided that the character I would act and the character I would write is a girl who has panic attacks and she time travels when she has panic attacks. And that's the character that I play in the Bright Sessions. And I had the character, I had the drive to do it, but I had no other resources. I'd never taken a screenwriting class, I had no idea what to do, um, and I was in a friend's web series at the time and I saw how many resources just a small web series took. I did not have those resources. This is where the second lesson comes into play, which is build with the resources you have. It's very obvious, it's very simple, but something that if there's any sort of tentpole of my work, it's this. It's looking around at the resources that I directly have in front of me, both the sort of concrete hard resources and the ones that are a little bit more nebulous, and letting that drive the creativity. So with the Bright Sessions, I stepped back and I thought, what are the things that I actually can do? I'm not a very visual person, but I know audio editing. And I know audio editing actually because very directly of this building. <laughs> I learned the entire Adobe Creative Suite downstairs in the media center um, for my various you know, video, <laughs> media center, yeah, uh, video and, and audio projects I did in school. Um, to this day, I still don't understand Photoshop, but Adobe Audition, the audio editing software stuck and I knew that. And so I was like, okay, I know how to edit something in Adobe Audition and I also kind of know how to publish a 
podcast maybe because I'd had a uh, radio show, WCWM. That's a photo of me in the radio station back in like 2011. Um, and my parents live in New York and I wanted them to be able to listen to the radio show. And so I got somebody at the station to show me how to record my broadcasts, download them and publish them online. Sort of my, my proto podcast. I didn't do it right. I'm pretty sure I didn't do it right. So I don't think I ever actually made a podcast, but those files still might exist somewhere on the internet. So I, 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 I was thinking, okay, it's gonna be audio fiction, but the most obvious thing to do with this story is to travel back in time with this character. And I know audio editing, but I don't know sound design. I can't sound design ancient Greece or World War I or a 70s roller rink or wherever she's gonna go. So she needs to be in an environment that's very, very simple. And also, I don't want it to be single narrator. I want it to be a dialogue, but I don't know how to write big scenes. But what I did know was two-person dialogue because I was in acting class every single week where I was cold reading scenes with one other actor and doing these two-person scenes from great scripts. And so even though I hadn't taken a screenwriting course, I sort of fundamentally understood the rhythm of a two-person scene. I knew what it was supposed to sound like. I knew what it was supposed to feel like. And so those limitations, I don't know how to sound design and I only know how to write dialogue for two people, <laughs> set a really interesting limit for what this story could be. I had this character, who was she gonna be talking to? And that's when it occurred to me, she should be talking to a therapist. And all of a sudden what started as just an idea for a character became like an actual idea. A therapist whose patients have supernatural abilities is like a real idea that you can get mileage from. Um, and I got a lot of mileage from it. I did four main seasons, three spinoffs, three books, and several TV development deals. It has yet to make it to the small screen, but we live in hope. Um, so, you know, it, it was an idea that really had some legs to it. And I, Okay, so now I knew what I was gonna be doing. What were the other resources I had? I had a friend who would be in it. She also had a mic, great, that's sorted. I'm gonna ask these two other actors from my acting class to be in it and promise them pizza and audio for their voice reels. Like that's the best that I can do. And then I was testing out the mic and it was not a very good mic. We were recording in my bedroom. That photo there is when we updated our uh, setup, but we did record all four seasons of the main run of the Bright Sessions in my West Hollywood bedroom. And so, on that mic testing it for that first season, I was like, this doesn't sound good. I'm not an engineer. I am not somebody who knows how to clean up audio. What am I gonna do? Like, I don't know that people are gonna wanna listen to this. It doesn't sound very good. And if you go and listen to the first season of The Bright Sessions now, I'm sorry, it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> um, but what I decided instead was to make that part of the story. Instead of this just being a scene between a therapist and a patient, I decided the therapist was going to be covertly recording these sessions. There was gonna be a recorder hidden somewhere in the room and that would explain why the audio is not very good. And also, it opens up this really interesting story possibility of why is this therapist secretly recording her sessions? Who is she sharing these recordings with? It allowed me to have her give notes into the recorder at the beginning and end of every episode so that I could just give some exposition as I figured out how to write a script. <laughs> So embracing those limitations is incredibly important and something that can lead to so much creativity and something I do all the time now. You know, we had to record everything over Zoom throughout the last couple of years because of the pandemic and embracing those limitations, writing towards that has been something that's been really interesting to explore. So I think that, yeah, the limitations can lead to the most interesting creative paths. So I made the show, we made the first season, it was really fun. Nobody was listening to it, but we were having a good time. So I just kept writing more and more and more. We started getting more and more listeners. And then all of a sudden it became something that people were really interested in. And from there, I produced four seasons of the show, basically by myself, writing, directing everything, eventually got a sound designer. And by the time that I was finishing up the fourth season of The Bright Sessions, I was being offered jobs in podcasting. I was getting the final you know, dot, dotting the I's and, and crossing the T's on my book deal. Just that one idea of recording in my bedroom led to all of this stuff. And throughout all of it, I got really, really lucky because in 2015, when I released The Bright Sessions, other audio dramas were coming out around the same time and the audio drama community turned out to be really, really supportive. And that's the third and final lesson, which I don't think I have to tell anybody in this room because we're all about community here at William & Mary, building your community. Um, and there's sort of three parts of community that have been really integral to my career and to my life. The first are the, you know, the, the people that are in power to give you a job, right? <laughs> Those are the people sort of you're classically networking with. Then there's your peers, and then there are the people that are supporting your work, so your audience, your readers, your listeners, your fans. And for me, 
the peers have been the most important. The peers when I was starting out were my actors, bringing them in on the creative process, letting them tell me what they felt about the characters and what they wanted to see for their characters. Bringing them in on that collaborative process led to some really interesting story choices. Reaching out to fellow audio drama creators who were releasing shows at the same time and telling them that I loved their show and would they want to get coffee led to us supporting each other's shows, working on each other's shows, recommending each other for jobs. That peer-to-peer -peer networking is, I think, the most important. And then, in terms of the people who were you know, maybe above me further along in their career, once again, I just got really lucky. Part of what inspired me to make The Bright Sessions, that to feel confident that someone would listen to an audio drama, was a show called Welcome to Night Vale, which is largely considered the most formative and influential uh, fiction podcast of all time. It's been running for over 10 years. It sort of kicked off the new wave of audio drama that occurred in the 20 teens. And I loved it. I was listening to it before The Bright Sessions. And Jeffrey Craner, one of the creators of Welcome to Night Vale, somehow found the Bright Sessions, listened to it, and tweeted out about it. And that like boosted our audience an enormous amount. That was in our second season. And also gave me an inroad to like reach out to Jeffrey Craner and be like, oh my god, you're Jeffrey Craner. Like, yeah, I can't believe you've listened to my podcast. But more, most importantly of all, it taught me something really, really vital and something I've really tried to emulate as I've moved forward in my career and grown which is to always send the ladder back down. Jeffrey and Joseph, you know, were the, the very tippy top of the audio fiction ladder, and they've always made a point to shout out other shows, to lift up creators coming up after them, and that's something I try to do as well, because fostering a, a welcoming community in whatever field you're in is the best thing that you can do for your career and for your work life, because if everybody feels welcomed, if everybody feels empowered, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, it's really just going to make a huge difference. And I think that doing that through sharing your passion, through leaning on that enthusiasm that you have, the reason that you're doing this in the first place is the best way to, to treat all of those communities, right? Whether they're your peers or somebody who could give you a job, just treating them as somebody who's also enthusiastic about the thing that you're enthusiastic about. I always joke that networking is about having a conversation with somebody and then getting a job in three years. And that's true. I was at a Spotify dinner once, weirdest podcast event I ever went, went to. It was like 30 podcasters around one dining room table eating dinner together, which was bizarre. But I was seated next to a Netflix exec executive and I really wanted to like hound her with questions about what Netflix was doing in their podcasting. But instead we just talked about like the shows we were watching, the podcasts we were listening to, what we enjoyed. And then lo and behold, two and a half years later, she emails me an NDA and says, sign this. And we hop on a call. And that's how I ended up making a Stranger Things podcast with Netflix, which is one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. But it was just the enthusiasm. And it was also the enthusiasm and then making my own stuff consistently and always sort of staying on her radar as a podcaster. And that enthusiasm is also how I build an audience rather than marketing or promoting or advertising to fans I like to try and build a community of listeners. Um, that photo there is a, a stranger's arm with a tattoo of my words on it, which always blows my mind. And I've gotten lots of photos like that through the years. And it's because people care about the things that I make because I care about them and because I care that they care. And it's just like this back and forth of enthusiasm and caring. And so ap approaching community in that way and knowing that community is the long game, right? Not only the talk to somebody, get a job in three years, but that you and your peers are going to move in and out of, of success and failures and your lives and always making sure to support your peers, be supported by them, lean on them. Um, as time goes on is really important. Uh, a fun fact, the photo on the left there is me and Evan Cunningham, who that's us after a double take concert. And now he composes like all the music for all of my podcasts. So and I've known him for over 10 years. So you never know the people that are going to be supporting you. Um, and I've been talking for so long and I want to make sure that we get to questions. Um, so yeah, those are just a couple of lessons that I've learned. Always make sure to understand your passion, embrace the limitations and build off the resources you have and always make sure to focus on building community. Um, and yeah, I would love to take some questions from you guys now if you have them. Thank you so much for listening. Good morning. Thanks. I'm standing behind the Hi. <laughs> Because I, I find that in, in 
work as in life. Criticism is an essential part of how we grow. Yeah, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. Constructive criticism is so vital. I think for me, the most important thing is always um, making sure I understand where the criticism is coming from and why. I think, you know, criticism from from your peers, from the people that you work with, your collaborators, obviously when you're writing, a, you know, a, a book, your editor, <laughs> um, listening to those people, really being in dialogue with them is incredibly important. When it comes to criticism from sort of like the wider world, you know, we're all on social media, especially if you're a creative and you have to deal with a lot of stuff. Um, 90% of that is stuff that you should just ignore. Um, but there is a, always a 10%, um, usually about something that, like for me, you know, the Bright Sessions is a show, and a lot of the shows I've, I've um, written that deal with like pretty sensitive issues, and so sometimes those things are, are coming from a place of, oh, you were representing this experience, and my experience was actually pretty different, and you know, here's why that was frustrating for me. I think those types of criticisms from sort of the, the, the wider world can be helpful to, um, remind you that you don't always know everything and that you know you're 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 not always going to please everybody but you should sort of listen to the people who have different experiences so yeah when it comes to criticism make sure to pay attention to the source and like you have to learn how to block out the noise because there is a lot of noise Somebody who is an avid podcast listener and enjoys the audio drama from here and now, hearing about this story makes me really interested. And just because the season one was a little bit rough, what was your, I guess my question is, what was your recommendation for an individual who wants to get into this world of price hub? Would you recommend the books, the podcast, or? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think, um, <laughs> Story-wise, unfortunately, the first season is the best place to start. <laughs> um, actually, on the, the Bright Sessions website, thebrightsessions.com, um, we have like a, a sort of list of everything that happens, like the, the canon order of how everything happens. So actually, technically, the second book of the trilogy is actually the first thing in events because it's a prequel novel. But yeah, I would start with the first season, and if like the audio, you can't take it, the first book is a great, is a great entry point because that takes place over the first couple seasons of the podcast and is just like a nice light love story it's nothing too intense and we'll introduce you to the characters in the world but thanks that's a great question no Thank you so much. That's a that's a really really great question. Um, yeah, I I worked a day job until I was finished making the first four seasons of the Bright Sessions. So um, 2018 was really the year that I was able to um, quit that day job and uh, move into writing full time. And I got really lucky at the at the time. Um, I had a day job that was incredibly flexible. I was a like data entry search engine evaluator, which is like a job that is very hard to get now because everyone wants to do remote work. But back then I, I, I was able to get, and so I was able to do it from anywhere, kind of any time, which provided me a lot of flexibility. But the first job, I, I was never paid to write the Bright Sessions until uh, the later seasons that were spinoffs. So the first job I ever got to actually be paid to write was Passenger List. Um, and that was something where, you know, I was very involved with the audio drama community. John Dryden, the creator of that show, reached out to me to write an episode of it. And he sent me his outline and was like, pick an episode that you want to write. And we hopped on Zoom. And I had so many ideas about the season as a whole that he was like, do you want to just co-produce and co-direct this with me? And I was like, OK. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up doing that. Um, but even now, you know, that. This year has been very strange with the strikes and everything, and you know my work has been really affected by that. Really happy that the WGA uh, we got what we wanted. SAG, we'll see. Um, that's me at a SAG rally a couple months ago, um, and you know I, I it's about building up your savings from those big jobs, right? Like from my book deal, from those TV development deals, putting that money immediately into savings and just not touching it, and just then living paycheck to paycheck. And I still kind of live paycheck to paycheck a lot of the time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just get a good lawyer who's going to argue good rates for you and put money in savings. <laughs> uh, 
and start your Roth IRA earlier than I did. <laughs> Hello. Um, you talked a lot about the luck of getting jobs or people reaching out to you. Can you talk about how you transitioned the, your friends in your living room to like, oh, maybe I should be pushing this out into the world. Like, what did you do to start monetizing your passion before the moment? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I spent a lot of time on Tumblr and Reddit. That's, like, the honest answer. Um, so, yeah, I, I've always been, yeah, really into stuff. And so I've always been deep in fandom spaces. Tumblr is a uh, social media blogging platform that nobody's on anymore except for me. But back in, you know, 2013, 2014, it was the place to be for fandom. And that's actually how I found Welcome to Night Vale. And there were still a lot of Welcome to Night Vale fans on there. And so, like, I was in conversation with those people. And we were talking about how much we loved Welcome to Night Vale and giving recommendations for other audio dramas. And I would be like, hey, I also have a show, like, if you want to listen. And people listened. And they liked it. And they shared it with their friends. And they did the same thing on Reddit. Um, and that's still a huge portion of my job now, actually. Like, I'm now on TikTok, which I have feelings about. <laughs> because you do have to keep up with things. But that's actually, like, when I do a time audit, that's usually what it's about to some, some extent. Of like, okay, I'm spending this much time on, on social media. I need to, you know, kick up now because I have a new show coming. So it's going to be this many hours a week on social media. And here's my strategy for that. Um, so, yeah, social media and just, like, being on there literally every day trying to get people to listen. And then word of mouth. Like, to, to this day, word of mouth is actually still the best way that podcasts get audiences. So, like, recommend podcasts to your friends. It doesn't have to be one of mine. Just, like, recommend the podcast you love to your friends. <laughs> In terms of like the the actual like production of, yeah. so yeah, I mean the the first season of the Bright Sessions was produced with a Blue Yeti microphone, which is like an eighty dollar mic, and then a laptop, and like that was the extent of the resources that were like hard and fast resources, and then the other resource was just like all of my time <laughs> and watching a lot of YouTube tutorials about um, audio editing and sound design. I recorded pretty much every sound effect that you hear in the first season with the exception of the tape recorder click I recorded in my parents house in New York because they have a really creaky house and so I just went around uh with a microphone and like did footsteps and like did do doors opening and closing um the sound of Sam time traveling like her vanishing and time traveling is me going <laughs> into a microphone <laughs> And then I just distorted it a bunch and like mixed it with like some other things. Um, and then my eventual sound designer like took that and they were like, I'm going to make this a real sound effect. And they like designed a real sound effect. So in later seasons, it's like a real sound effect. But um, yeah, I mean, it truly was just that $80 mic, a USB mic that plugged right into the laptop and then like a table and two chairs and uh, some iPads. Like I, I borrowed some iPads from friends to have the scripts on the iPads because page turns are a real nightmare to edit out. Um, does that answer the question? Okay, cool. <laughs> As someone who found the right sessions through Welcome to Night Fair, um, I always find, found it really fascinating how podcasts only having really one sense that they can uh, use. That is obviously a very clear limitation when you don't have visuals. But I've also noticed, Bright Sessions included, that there are really creative ways that you can use an audio only medium such as tape recorder or how in Welcome to Night Vale they give you not enough details for it to be less scary. So um, I'm wondering what other sort of limitations you found in the podcast that you give that have that you also find very engaging. One of my favorite things in putting together a podcast is vocal diversity. And like obviously when casting a project, you want to look at all kinds of diversity, right? Like I, I always want to make sure that my casts are, are wide reaching. But vocal diversity is like when I'm not looking at these two people, do they sound different enough? Because I think something that's really interesting and challenging in podcasting is making sure that your, your characters are going to read as separate characters to the audience. And even if you get like five really different voices, anytime I'm writing something, anytime I'm producing someone, el someone else's work, 
I always say, you know, you can have as many characters as you want in the first episode, but in the first two episodes, you can't have more than five main characters. Like anything, if you need your, if you need your audience to remember more than five people, they're not going to until they recognize these people's voices. And so like, that's a limitation that I really enjoy, right? Because if you have an ensemble of, you know, seven to 10 people, how do you make sure that they're all distinct? How do you make sure that they're all unique? Um, a, sh a show that I produced in Strange Woods, which is a five episode musical podcast, sort of like a documentary um, style podcast that's also a musical. That has a ton of characters, but because it's formatted as a, an interview-based documentary, the person interviewing the you know subject is saying their name or is giving an intro, and so that's like a little bit of a cheat to help the audience remember this cast of like twelve to fifteen people that they need to remember. So oftentimes it's yeah about figuring out like okay how many people are going to be in this, what's the story I'm trying to communicate, and how are the ways that I can do that without being way too exposition-y about it. And sometimes that means, yeah, having a framing device of an interview or, um, a, yeah, a recorded a tape or something like that. And, and sometimes if you're just writing something that's like straight ahead and doesn't sort of have a, a device for why you're, you're listening to it, um, can be an even greater challenge, which I really enjoy. Um, it was, that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about acting Sam in a really long time. <laughs> um, it definitely was easier. I mean, I, I basically just, yeah, sort of did a, a more outwardly panicked version of myself. Um, and I think what I learned very quickly was that it's, it, it's not acting a character that you've written that's hard. It's directing a character that you're acting that's hard. Never do all three. <laughs> um, never direct, act, and write. Because I would be so focused on directing the other actors and making sure that, you know, I was I was giving them good directions that, like, I wouldn't notice my performance until I was, like, editing it. And then I'd be like, oh, God, why did you make that choice? Um, so I really came to, to rely on my actors. And that, like, that original cast of The Bright Sessions, like, those people became some of my closest friends. I was like in one of their weddings, you know, and so relying on them to sort of like give me feedback and to kind of help me along and to help me act by being in the scene with me, I think was, was sort of the, the main thing I focused on. And now I do not direct myself anymore. <laughs> um, hi. Um, hi. <laughs> I, as somebody Yeah, I mean, I think it can be very scary with the amount of media that's out there now. Like, there's just, like, a million TV shows, a million podcasts, a million books. Um, that is still a, a question I'm trying to answer for myself all the time. Because the other thing that was hard to reconcile um, and that I struggle with even now is that you've had a successful show. You have to build the audience from square one on your next one the audience does not and some of the audience comes over but you're basically starting over each time which is like oh god like I did this for so many years um social media really is like the the way that I have uh, built the the bright citizens audience I also do think that yeah those those peer-to-peer -peer relationships getting to know fellow podcasters getting to know fellow authors um one of the the greatest resources I think for people coming into the scene now if you if you want to write audio fiction or if you just want to write at all and you're curious about audio fiction um I'm not a member of the WGA because the WGA doesn't actually cover fiction podcasts yet but I am on the organizing committee with the WGA to unionize audio it's the WGA audio alliance we have a discord if you just like google WGA audio alliance and go to the page you can join the discord you don't have to be a professional published writer you, you can just like be in the discord that's a great place to meet people see what other people are doing people promote their shows people work on each other's shows I think that that getting your name out there um, as you're starting out through your peers can be a great way working on other people's stuff is a great way as well because then if you know they really like working with you they're going to shout out your show or if the audience really likes your episode or whatever like they're going to go and listen to your show but I think ultimately the most important thing to, to focus on is making sure that the story you're telling is one that you are incredibly passionate about. Um, there was a period of time where a lot of people were getting into audio fiction just because it was cheap to make compared to TV. And they were making a lot of stuff that was just like, this was a TV pilot that I didn't sell that I'm just going to throw into audio and it 
doesn't work. You have to adapt it. Um, and there wasn't really like care there. And then those things didn't do well. And it's not that they didn't do well because like audio fiction, people aren't listening to audio fiction. They didn't do well because audiences know when something doesn't have heart in it. So I think focusing on the, telling your story the way that you want to tell it um, and also not being afraid of like, I, I encounter a lot of people who are like, I have this idea for a story, but someone's already sort of told this idea in this in this way. And my advice to that is always like, you haven't told it. And so, you know, giving your full perspective on the story that you're telling and putting your heart into it, I think is the best thing you can do. Hi. <laughs> Like, how long should a podcast episode be, basically? Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things I really love about fiction podcasting is like, it can be whatever you want it, want it to be. Um, I've produced episodes. I mean, there are some podcasts out there that are f the lengths of, of feature films, right? They're an hour and a half, two hours long. Um, the podcast I'm doing right now, Breaker Whiskey, is one to five minutes every single day. That's just the episodes are, you know, one minute long. Um I, I think there's, you know, there's a, a move to sort of have most podcast episodes be between 25 and 40 minutes, but unlike TV or film, there aren't these constraints that have been built around it because of sort of technical things or, or industry norms. And so, yeah, you can tell your story however you want to tell it in whatever way you want to tell it, which is, I think, really fun. Hi. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Thanks. Um, I know endings are particularly hard to write, and I just was wondering how you would uh, typically tackle it if you have like a conclusion in mind at the beginning, or if you just kind of go with the flow. Yeah, I mean, with the Bright Sessions, I got lucky in that I got to end it three times because I, I, I knew um, I was going to end after season four. I think a lot of uh, our favorite narratives have a problem of going for too long and becoming not our favorite narratives anymore. And I was like terrified of that happening. And so I did have like a broad idea of where I wanted the Bright Sessions to end in terms of the characters being okay, <laughs> right? Like a lot of the characters start in not okay places and sort of my main thing was getting them to that okay place. But in terms of like the plot that sort of happened to get them there, that was a, um, like a little bit of a thing I discovered along the way. And then the later seasons of The Bright Sessions were these spin-offs that um, a company, Luminary, licensed um, and paid for, which was great. But each for each of those, I didn't know if I was going to get an additional season. And they were sort of these contained stories anyway. And so that like was very intentional. Like one season, we're going to start here. We're going to end here. This is the story that we're telling. And now for a lot of my shows, like for something like Bridgewater, I try to do that. Um, within a season just because like you never know when you're not going to have funding anymore <laughs> and so it's just it's just really like they're usually with the first season I might let it end on a cliffhanger but I try to tie things up by the end of the second season just in case I don't get to tell more and the flip side of that is always making sure that there is more story to tell if you get the opportunity so it's a, it's a careful balance of leaving room for yourself but making sure to tie up one particular thing so the audience isn't left hanging forever. <laughs> I'll ask one more. I'll ask yeah. Great. Uh, I'm the director of special collections here at the Virginia Women Writers Archive, and I would hope you would consider uh, donating your uh, creative work and so forth for special collections for preservation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk after this. That sounds great. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll just end by letting you know that Lauren is going to be signing books. The bookstore is here. Thank you for that. And so if you'd like to get a copy of a book signed, um, please do. And just enjoy yourself. We're really happy to have you hang out. And um, we'll be around if you have 
questions about the library. Um, lots of people in this room have served on the library board. We actually have an advancement board at William & Mary. We have lots of them, but we have one for the library. I see many of our former and current board members in the room. So if you want to talk about how to be more involved at William & Mary and you're interested in talking about our board, um, you can talk to me or any of them. So thank you so much. Really happy to have you here today. And go Tribe. <laughs>